This is the AX in Focus series. We've now turned to the subject of Zive, or the External Interrupt Virtualization Engine. Hello, my name is Nigel Griffiths. I work in Power Systems Advanced Technology Support in Europe. This topic of Zive is state of the art computer engineering. It comes with AX on Power 9 servers and it's not available on other operating systems. This is going to give you back some of your CPU cycles that you're using to handle interrupts. On a big, modern, busy computer, we're getting tens of millions of interrupts a second from our various adapters like the network, the SAN, or the disk subsystems. Zive then releases back some of your CPU cycles handling these. That gets you more CPU power for your applications. In this series, we're not covering the basic level commands. Like you can see examples here. This is an advanced level function. Actually for the systems administrator, there's not much for them to do apart from check that it is switched on. Now, the problem with talking about Zive is about interrupts and not many people understand how they actually work. So we're gonna do a reminder here, a 101 class in interrupt handling in the Unix architecture. User level programs are running on the system. They could be a simple corn shell, or it could be a group of programs that are running as an application, like a relational database. They're sitting in their virtual memory using the CPUs, but they can't actually deal with the real world out there. It uses the kernel to talk to networks and disks and anything else you've got in your computer. To do this, they make a system call, which is a function call in the language is written. Most things in Unix are files, so you open a file, then you can read and write it, and then finally you can close that file. Or sometimes you just want to get information from the kernel. The very simplest of system call is to get the process ID of your program. You make the system call, it goes into the kernel, it looks up the ID of your process, it's sitting in memory, it's just a simple memory copy to give you that number back, and then it returns from the system call. The kernel may decide to go and run some other program, and later on it will come back to this program and return from the system call. So it has to do a context switch as the system call comes in, so it can save the state of your program so it can rerun it later on. So context switch involves saving and restoring a whole bunch of things. There's the program counter, that's a register that points to the next instruction in your program that, that will be executed. We have a stack pointer that, are, that points to the heap of data that you're manipulating as you're going. 32 registers there, there could be integers or pointers in those registers. That's the sort of scratch pad area in the computer. There's a bunch of condition bits. Whenever you do an operation, it sets condition bits for the number was positive or negative or zero and a whole bunch of other things. And these can be used for using branch instructions to move off to a different part of the code once you've made a decision. There's also the floating point context has to be saved and the virtual memory context. The user program is running in virtual memory and it can't get to any memory that it's not allowed, that's not in its context. If it does that, the kernel will instantly halt it and say it's a memory violation and stop you going any further. All of these things are required so that we can later restart the program once we've taken the data it's trying to push to us or we've given it the data that it requested. There is another way you can get into the Unix kernel. This is from the interrupt controller. Assuming we've asked an adapter to go get us some data and it's just arrived back, then the adapter sitting in the PCI slot tells the interrupt controller, I finished this job, I need the kernel now to deal with the data. Now this is a high priority task because the adapters have a certain amount of space on them and more data is coming in, so we want to capture the data before it overruns the buffers in the adapter. Of course, the kernel hasn't got a processor that it's actually using. They're all being used by the user program, so it has to interrupt the user program, does a context switch, just as we claimed before, and call the device driver to deal with the interrupt. Once that's done, it goes back to the kernel, and then the kernel will want to do some housekeeping while it's in the kernel. There may be other things that it can do while it's there. So for example, there may be other items queued up to go out on your SAN or your LAN or your disk adapters. So it will queue those into the device driver, they'll get pushed into the adapter so it has a long list of items it's got to do. And then we're, we're done for now and we can re-enter the user program by doing a context switch back to it. All of this can be happening hundreds of thousands or even millions of times a second on a large machine or large logical partition or virtual machine. Of course, if we have virtual machines, then things get a little bit more complicated.
So now we move to the 201 class, things are more complicated, we got virtual machines. Again, the adapter has to tell a kernel that it's finished doing what it's asked. The interrupt controller is then going to interrupt, but this time it has three different virtual machines. It's not sure which it needs to interrupt. The interrupt controller is a fairly dumb device. So what it'll do, it'll have to decide which machine it needs a processor to do that. And so it's going to interrupt one of the virtual machines to get hold of a processor to work out which virtual machine actually needs it. So in this case, it's just decided virtual machine one is going to do a context switch of whatever it was doing, get to hypervisor mode, then it will work out which machine. In this case, it's going to be virtual machine three. So now we hand off the interrupt into virtual machine three, and it can go through the standard handling that we've seen before. Now, in actual fact, with these bigger machines, the virtual machines tend to have, you know, between two to 20 to 192 potentially CPUs or virtual CPUs inside each of the virtual machines. And it'd be very nice if we could get the interrupt handled by the same processor as the one that asked for it. This is because the device driver code and the data associated should be in that virtual processor so it doesn't have to pull through the code and data out of the caches into the processor to actually get started handling the interrupt. So Zive is implemented in the hypervisor. It maintains this routing table in the main memory of the server. Zive and AIX maintains this in-memory data so we can determine the target virtual machine and virtual processor. The interrupt controller is a little bit more intelligent now. It uses that table to correctly target the right virtual machine and virtual processor. And the hypervisor isn't involved at all, and we skipped a whole context switch. Now that's fairly easy. The problems are the complications that could happen. Here's just a few as an example. The CPU cores could actually be running in multiple virtual machines. So we've got to get the interrupt to happen when the CPU is actually in the right virtual machine. The VPs, the virtual processors, could be folded away, like not running. AOX, for example, if it says it can maintain the performance of the machine only using half of the virtual processors, it switches them off. It tells the hypervisor, don't schedule this one, I can do this all on the remaining virtual processors. So when it comes back as an interrupt, from the adapter, the virtual processor that started it may not actually be running at the moment. There's no point in giving it the interrupt because it will just ignore it, it's not running. In which case it uses another virtual processor in the same virtual processor group. If we look at LPAR2 here, it has four virtual processors, maybe two of them are switched off. If it can't find those running, then it will hand it to another virtual processor in the same LPAR. It would have to be paged into the cache but at least we'll get the interrupt handled very quickly. As well as that, we might be doing dynamic virtual processor changes. So we may have made a LPAR a lot bigger or a lot smaller, so that the numbers of the virtual processors are changing on the fly as well. That has to be handled. We also have dynamic processor optimization, which may be changing the virtual processors being used by a logical partition or virtual machine and its associated memory. If we're actually having an interrupt from a virtual machine not running AX 7.2 TL4 above, so it's running one of the other operating systems or an older version of AX, then the fallback mechanism is to use the old way of doing things. So back to our previous chart, how does Zive change that? Well, we take out all this left-hand mechanism, we route to the right virtual machine and the right virtual processor first time. Right then, that's the theory. Let's get practical. What are the prerequisites to running with this Zive on? You have to be on a Power9 server or later. Logical partition or virtual machine has to be in power nine mode. I've got a whole slide describing what that means. Has to be firmware level 940 or above. Has to be AX 72TL4 SP2 or above. And that actually applies also to the VO server 311, which is running the same AX version. Installation, well, it's just part of the AX upgrade or install. Activation is automatic. If any of these prerequisites fail, then you'll be using the uh, traditional method of interrupt handling. I do worry though, if you're doing an upgrade, you may have to check that it's switched on. If you're doing a new install with all the prerequisites, then it's probably switched on by default. There's no monitoring for you to do, so there's nothing here to uh, worry about. The benefits are that it just goes faster. Now, everybody's gonna say, well, what sort of percentage 
is that and that depends on your workload if you're on a machine that's just using applications tuning away on memory all the time not doing much io san network or disks then it's not going to make any difference at all if you've got an application that's doing everything on the network thousands and thousands of packets per second even millions of packets a second then it's going to have a bigger impact in improving your performance on a typical computer we have like 85 percent of the cpu time is in user mode running your applications and maybe 10 percent of the time you're in kernel mode that's the, called the system utilization we've seen the top half doesn't affect it very much the system calls the bottom half while we're doing the interrupt handling that's going to be affected so we're going to affect some of half of the 10 percent so we're into perhaps a handful of percent of extra cpu power you'll have when this is switched on now for user commands and actions well there's not much we'll cover those in the next two slides now chris Gibson works in IBM Lab Service in Australia, had a recent blog entry, found some useful commands that are worth checking, particularly if you're upgrading AX to the right level. So we can use LS Atra on Sys0 and look for this external interrupt virtualization field, and it should be true. If it's false, then there's the change data command, and then you have to reboot to get yourself into the right mode, and then worth checking again that it's uh, set the right way. Also, he's come up with another one, uh, I always worry about using the KDB command. Uh, there's a little bit of danger of warning there. Do they get this right? And uh, if we use this command, you can actually take the end bits off to work out what he's doing. He's looking for a particular field in the output. If it's two, then it's losing the legacy interrupts. And if it's three, Zive interrupts are active. I always find Chris a bit annoying, like, where does he find out these things? But so here's a little one from me as well. We use the L past that minus capital H and look for this particular field, H underscore X R X I R R. Then if it's all zeros, then the hypervisor isn't dealing with the interrupts. Uh, if there are any numbers in those fields coming out, then it means the hypervisor is dealing with the interrupts. And so Zive is switched off. Now let's look at what it means to be in power nine mode. If you go to your HMC, select a partition, click on processors, then you have to hit the button with advanced on it, which is the top right, then the bottom, you get these advanced settings. And we can see in here that we have a power nine mode and a power nine base. Now the power nine base just magically appeared as we upgraded to the 940 firmware. So what's going on there? And to be quite blunt, this gets my nomination from dumb idea of 2020. So if you're in the older firmware, we have power seven, eight, and nine. When you've upgraded, you get power seven, eight, power nine base and power nine. So this power nine is not the same as this power nine. Now I can see what they're doing in here. I would have much preferred to have power nine and power nine advanced and not change the name when the firmware was upgraded. This power nine on this firmware means that you've enabled certain features like Zive and the NX GZIP accelerator. And there's also implications for live partition mobility. Now we'll save those for a different video. It's actually documented very briefly in the release notes and here's a link to it. I'll put that link in the description of the video on YouTube. I said when we started that IBM seems a little bit reluctant to talk about this. It's an excellent computer engineering project that's going to give us, for practically no work at all, extra CPU time. And it's only really going to be available from computers that come from one place. So IBM makes the Power 9 processors, we write the firmware, and we write the operating system. We can pull all that together to get it to work unlikely to happen perhaps in the linux on intel world where it's coming from different places it was actually very carefully and clearly documented in this article that is available from the ieee i think you have to be a member or at least have a password to get hold of the article the two authors in here have 120 patents between them and one of them has been working for ibm for 47 years so they really know what they're talking about it's 10 pages long but i got lost about page three or four uh, it's very detailed uh, i've done units kernel programming in my past but it goes right into the details of the power nine 
processor and the way we do things in big computers. There is an abstract that you can get hold of from the IEEE website, and I recommend you read that. I won't read it out to you. It gives you a good overview of how this is actually put together to give us the benefits. Okay, that's all I've got on Zive, part of our AX in Focus series. If you enjoyed that video, learned something, give us a thumbs up and please subscribe, then you'll be told when the next video is uploaded. Thanks for listening.